where Penal Reform International's policy program is based. I'm delighted to welcome you all today to the side events to the 64th session of the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs on behalf of Penal Reform International and all of our co-organizing partners, the International Drug Policy Consortium, CELS, De Justicia, the Thailand Institute of Justice and the Washington Office on Latin America. Before we start, um, I just wanted to remind you that today's event is being recorded and we're working in English and Spanish today, so please choose your correct channel in the interpretation box now. Um, we hope to have some time for questions after we've heard from our panelists, so please feel free to add any questions you have in the chat box throughout the event. Um, we'll also be sharing some key resources in the chat box as we go along, so keep an eye out for those. And although we're unfortunately not all together physically at the TND in Vienna today, this um, event is intended to serve as a Vienna launch for the book published late last year, The Impact of Global Drug Policy on Women Shifting the Needle. This book, um, which we encourage you all to read if you haven't already, um, examines the impact of drug criminalization and enforcement on women from women's perspectives um, with many chapters from academics, advocates, activists, and those with lived experience. So we're very fortunate to be hearing from some of those authors today. So let us begin without any delay with some opening remarks uh, via video message from Elizabeth Broderick, chair of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Dear panelists, participants, and organizers of this event, I'm honored to speak to you as chair of the UN Working Group on discrimination against women and girls. As you know, putting women on the agenda of global drug policy is still at an early stage of what will likely be quite a long journey. The importance of a gender perspective, particularly in the participation of women in policy making on drug related issues, was only recently acknowledged by the international community at the UN General Assembly special session on drugs in 2016. Our UN Working Group has called upon states to meaningfully address the specific concerns of women in international and national drug policies and to ensure a central place for women's rights. Today's event, focusing on the impact of global drug policy on women, represents our continuous collective effort in bringing much needed a fo focus to this area. Can I warmly congratulate all those involved in the publication of this powerful book, which brings an explicit focus on women. I also love that the book is freely available to the public. An estimated 740,000 women and girls are imprisoned across the world. The drastic increase in women's incarceration is in part due to drug related charges. We find that proportionally more women than men are serving prison sentences in relation to drug offences. From region to region, the situation of women in prison and those on drug related charges in particular, paints a consistent picture of economic, social and gender inequality. It calls for an urgent response that addresses the root causes of structural discrimination against women. And structural discrimination against women is at the heart of our mandate as a UN working group. We examine discrimination faced by women, not just in law, but also in practice, in all spheres of life with a life cycle approach. We see women's economic and social, public and political life as closely related to their life in the family and to their health and safety. So addressing the root causes of discrimination against women requires us to see women not just as another vulnerable group, but as an equal half of humanity with agency and autonomy. We've witnessed throughout our work that women often form more than half of those who live in situations of marginalization and vulnerability, and they experience multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. So that's the context within which women's experiences and the interactions with drugs and drug policies should be situated. 
Our working group has identified the main causes of women's deprivation of liberty as gender-based discrimination and stereotypical social norms, economic deprivation and violence against women. Women's pathways to drug-related offences are often driven by their situations of socioeconomic marginalisation, of poverty, of lack of opportunities and the absence of social protection from a state. Together, of course, with the need to support their family or involvement with men who use drugs. Gender-based violence and women's subordinate role in society, including within the family, also plays a significant role. Women's involvement in drug offences and, for example, as drug couriers, exposing them more to health and safety risks than men, they also run more risk of being caught. And not only that, women are disproportionately punished despite their often low-level, non-violent and first-time drug offences. Indeed, in our thematic report on women deprived of liberty, we found that judicial gender bias often subjects women to disproportionate sentencing for non-conformity with gender stereotypes. Stereotypical standards of women's moral conduct play a role in disproportionate female incarceration for drug-related crimes, as women are often judged much more strictly than men. Not only that, they have fewer opportunities to negotiate reduced sentences or plea bargains owing to their lower status within criminal networks combined with their subservient role in a patriarchal system. They face insurmountable barriers in accessing justice because of their financial inability to obtain effective legal representation and also because of a lack of gender sensitive administration of, of justice. It's clear that excessively punitively, punitive approaches of relying on law enforcement and criminal sanctions have failed women without achieving the health goals and with a particularly discriminatory and disproportionately disproportionate impact. Indeed, such approaches have only perpetuated the vicious cycle of victimization and put these women in situations of further injustice with detrimental impact on themselves and the families they support, often as the primary carer. Together with other human rights experts, our working group has called on states to implement the UN Bangkok rules to reduce the imprisonment of women around the world and to promote non-custodial alternatives to imprisonment, alternatives that are designed to meet women's needs and address the causes of their offending. States must fulfil their international commitments to protect women's human rights and take concrete measures to, uh, to give meaning to their commitments to mainstream a gender perspective in drug policies and programs. But for this to happen, they have to address the specific issues and concerns of women whilst drawing on good practices, good practices from countries which have invested in providing women with counselling assistance, with access to harm reduction and drug dependence treatment services, with access to job opportunities, and which have involved women at all stages of the development, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of drug policies and programs. The working group has recommended that states reform drug-related policies, laws and practices in line with international human rights standards and that they also take steps to integrate the international guidelines on human rights and drug policy into their own policies that are relevant to women. We will continue devoting considerable attention to this issue uh, and we will use all the tools at our disposal, including examining the issue um, of drugs and drug policy in our country visits and in our communications to states, and of course, in our continuous engagement with civil society stakeholders like yourselves. So thank you so much for the invitation to join you today, and I wish you a very productive discussion. Many thanks to Elizabeth Broderick for those opening remarks. I think it gives quite a, 
comprehensive roundup and very well sets the scene for today's event. So without further ado, we'll turn to our first speaker, uh, Isabel Pereira, who is a research coordinator on drug policy at Digisticia. And Isabel co-authored co a chapter on the impact of the war on drugs on women working in Colombian coca fields. So over to you, Isabel. Thank you, Triana, and good morning or evening, wherever you may be. I'll try to keep up with time. I know we were very tight. So just uh, I want to thank the the uh, the editors of the collection. And and this research was something that here you find the book that stemmed from a process back in 2017 when there was this, the signing of the peace agreement in Colombia. Uh, so at that moment, we knew there was a huge knowledge gap on what was the experience of women with regards to the coca crop? Well, the national monitoring system for coca crops has existed for many years. It only focuses on the number of hectares without a lot of regard on the humans behind and then le even less so on the women behind, behind this. At the moment of signing of the peace agreement, um, the peace agreement promised rural transformation with a gender focus. And we were very concerned about the fact that there was no way into implementing a gender focus if we didn't know who were the women behind um, the situation. So at that time, we were interested in really knowing what were the life trajectories and how women relate to the coca, um, to the coca crop and what positive and negative has brought into their lives. So I'm going to dissect my, my presentation into three segments. The first is the how, the second is the effects, and the third is uh, the future. So as for the first part, how do women participate in the coca economy and what are their reasons uh, for involvement? So the ways are very varied. It, it's not only that they harvest or that they work in the land, but also they make food for the workers. They also fumigate. They also process and transform coca leaves into coca paste and also just um, trade the goods while taking them into town. But they also move within these roles throughout their lives. And it also depends on whether or not they have a land or they are working on someone else's land. Um, all of these, um, these work that they do is complemented by the fact that most of them perform a role as social leaders in their community. So this picture you're seeing here is from the social cartography we did in one of the workshops. And you can see that their role goes into the private sphere. So in the home with their family, but goes out into the, into the public sphere where they perform social leadership roles. In this sense, you can say that these women have a triple workload. So within the household, within the work field, and within their social communities. And why does this happen? And why is there the need to get involved in so many tasks? And there's so much burden on these women. Basically, it, it, it's explained by the fact that, of where do we stand? So Putumayo, which is the region where we did the research, it's a, it's a peripheral region of the country. Um, most of the population does, doesn't have any schooling. There is not one single public university in the whole region. There is a 73% housing deficit. There is very scarce land tenure, and most of the land tenure is, is by men, not women. And the health system is not consolidated. There are, not, there are no tertiary roads available to get the, pro the produce out. So what this means is that all, all that which you would expect from the state as public services has to be done by their own means. And their own means uh, comes from the income of the coca crop. So basically you would hear that they pitch in a bit of money from what was left of the coca crop and then build a bridge or fix the communal house or fix the school. So these are the types of, of uh, duties and roles that women serve within uh, within their, their, their communities. So the second part as to what have been the impacts of drug, of drug policy, what are the effects for women to having been involved in the coca economy? So given that the presence of the state is so scarce, as I mentioned before, um, the, the, present, the presence only comes from uh, military and police forces. 
coca, the coca economy, and the link with armed conflict means that these communities were completely stigmatized. They were linked as guerrilla auxilia auxiliaries, or they were uh, even targeted as narco criminals themselves. So the only um, presence they know of the state is that of the military, the police forces, and of course, aerial spraying with glyphosate. Um, but then there are also positive, positive remarks in the relationship with, with coca crop. Can you go to the next slide, please? So I, I always like to share both the picture that's here and the testimony that is shared. This was Sandra, one of the women we interviewed. And there you can see in the picture, so at, the, at, at one side, the positive things, which is health, education, food, housing, uh, clothes, tourism, and then in the bad things, displacement, loss of um, loved ones, stigmatization, incarceration, and fumigation. So basically what you can see is that the positive things come from the plants, so basically their, their, their livelihood, and then the bad things come from the drug policy itself. The methods and the strategies by which the state has responded to the existence of coca crops has only deepened already existing conditions of marginality and poverty, has created new problems by way of aerial spraying with fumigation or even incarceration. And for those who for those of you who are, who are not breathing in Spanish, um, basically what Sandra tells us in the story is that her dad was the first one to get coca to the house and that they were going through a moment of a lot of poverty. And when he came back every week when they got involved in the coca trade, they were able to buy shoes and clothes for herself and for her sister. So she says at the end uh, the, that her first memory of coca is one of joy. And then we go into what are the possibilities, and can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so what are the possibilities and opportunities right now, five years into the peace agreement? So this is something that is not necessarily within the book, but just uh, updating the process into now. This is the panorama of what it means for them uh, being involved in the coca in the coca crops. And then at the bottom of the picture, you can see number five is when we asked them about the state presence and all that they drew was police, army, glyphosate, and paramilitaries. So this was the situation that was hopefully going to be solved through the peace agreement. But the implementation of the peace agreement, specifically the substitution programs has been um, not as strong as it, as we wish it would have been, even though families and communities have committed to their end, but the state has not fulfilled their part. This means for women, very particular risk in terms of being dispossessed of previously gained power struggles that they had gained through the coca crop and being further caught up in dangerous situations because they no longer have access to this petty cash that the coca was and most likely being uh, potentially exposed to the dangers of aerial spraying should this um, should this activity be resumed again as it's in the news all along so uh, this was a very quick overview, but I want to thank again and invite you all to check out the chapter of, of the book. And also if you're interested, this book, the research that it comes from is, is a book available in English and in Spanish. And it also has a podcast in Spanish that we'll be sharing to the links. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel, not least for keeping excellently to time. It's <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> Um, it's really useful to hear not only how yeah, women are affected and, and impacted both in the positive and the negative, as you say, driven only by the drug policies, but especially to think about ways forward and, and the continuing impact. So we'll turn now to our next speaker, uh, Dasha Makishina, who is a consultant working with UNAIDS, and uh, Dasha wrote the chapter on barriers to health services for women who use drugs in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Dasha, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Uh, can you also see the slides? Okay, so yeah, so my name is Dasha and I'm really, I really want to thank you for organizing the event and for joining the event. And also I want to thank my colleagues 
and friends from Eurasian Harm Reduction Association and a Ukraine NGO Sultanak. Because without my colleagues and my friends, who are also my friends, it won't be possible to learn all that we know today about women who inject drugs in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And I'm really happy that in the region there are a number of uh, community-led organizations that work in this area. So um, yeah, um, to begin with, I want to talk a little bit about the region and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So we are always talking about different number of countries because the borders of this region are, you know, somewhat um, uh, not always defined in the same way. But what we, um, so we're usually talking about um, 3 million people who inject drugs in this region. That's big, big number of people. But, and we roughly say that it's, you know, 12 to 25% of these uh, people who inject drugs are women. And more women, a lower proportion of women are in Eastern and Central Asian countries and a larger proportion is um, in, in, in the West. But unfortunately, we still do not have more accurate data about the number of women who inject drugs. And most of the estimates we have are very outdated. So they are of 2012 or earlier. And the chapter was written and the book was published um, in two, like, okay, around two years ago. But I would say that because of COVID, we are almost sure that there were no uh, population size estimate. So we are talking about a region where a lot of women inject drugs, but we don't even have data, you know, on, 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 on anything specific. How old are these women, where they live, about their health status. But there is something that we know about women who inject drugs, and this is about HIV prevalence. And the data that we have actually shows that in the majority of Eastern European countries, significantly more women are living with HIV uh, than, me, uh, than among men who inject drugs. So just to give one country example, from Estonia, 61% of women who inject drugs have HIV compared to 48% of men. And in Ukraine, these figures would be 31% of women who inject drugs live with HIV and 20% of men. So huge, huge populations that need health services, that need harm reduction services, and also access to social protection. So we all agree here, I think, that women who inject drugs are a key population for HIV, and they should be a priority popula uh, population for HIV prevention and treatment. And on this slide, I've also placed new global AIDS targets that were approved just a couple of weeks ago. And in the global AIDS targets, we have, um, you know, um, at least a few that are relevant here. One of them is that 90% of people who inject drugs should have access to comprehensive harm reduction services. And this 80% of these services should be key population and women led. That's on the one hand. And there is also a target related to women from key populations that they experience less gender-based inequalities. And I believe that low access to harm reduction services among women who inject drugs is a gender-based inequality that needs to be overcome. So the issue here that I want to draw your attention to is that since we don't have data on how many women who inject drugs live in the region, we actually cannot plan services. We cannot estimate, uh, we cannot evaluate if these services that are provided today, if they are gender uh, sensitive, what is the coverage of women who inject drugs at the baseline? How many new harm reduction sites, how many new gender sensitive harm reduction services we need to open and how much funding we need. So this issue of data is really a big one. Now I would like to spend some time to talk about the structural barriers because of course, and like the fact that services are not funded and are not available is an access barrier, but there are, but there are also structural barriers here. Yes, and thank you for, uh, for showing the second slide. So double stigma against women who use drugs 
rooted in drug policies and in gender inequality is not unique to Eastern Europe and Central Asia. We see this globally. What is unique to this region is the system, is the old Soviet system, so-called drug registry, drug registries, or in Russian it's narkotod, but I believe we don't have a lot of Russian speakers among our participants. Drug registries. What is that? So it is a system of state registration of all people who use drugs that was created more than 30 years ago in the Soviet Union. So, and it continues to be a core element of drug control of many post-Soviet states today, more than 30 years ago. So originally there was an order that was published, uh, that was, um, yeah, that was created in the Soviet Union that um, requested to organize mandatory drug treatment, but also to collect information and to share information between the police and health sectors about every person suspected of drug use, no matter if a person has dependency or not, like any person, men and women who could um, be, who was suspected of drug use should have been put on this registry. And the idea was to share this information without any confidentiality concerns, but that was 30 years ago. And I would like to say that, of course, in the majority of Eastern European and Central Asian countries, this law has, you know, the system has undergone significant changes, but the principle remained the same. And there were numerous studies in the region that showed that this, the fear of being placed on the drug registry continues to create barriers for women who use drugs to get access to any services. But if you're registered there, there is an increased risk of withdrawal parental rights. There is increased risk of unemployment. Women who are on the registry, they are more vulnerable to police abuse and arbitrary detention. And actually, if when you are arrested with drugs, and if you previously were included into this registry, it's higher risk of incarceration. Um, on the slide, on the right uh, side of the slide, you will see some citations, um, which those of you who speak English can read. Let's read one for translation. So one of them is automatically, I am a dysfunctional mother because I'm on the drug registry. So it's, 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 it, it creates stigma. It intensifies stigma. It, it actually reduces our, it limits our efforts to, you know, to remove stigma against women who use drugs. At the same time, if a woman is not registered in this drug registry, even though the system changed in many places and now it's so-called uh, voluntary registration, well, then you don't have access to opioid substitution treatment or other free of charge drug treatment. And also you can't avoid being put on the reg uh, registry in case of arrest. So I think that I will have to stop here and I will not um, be able now to present um, you know, the information regarding the results of this. But as you can see on the slides, the access to health services among women in the region is very, very low. Just one example, in Kazakhstan, which is a huge country, only 58 women were receiving methadone in 2018. So, and one of the reason is these registries, huge stigma and criminalization. Thank you. Thank you, Dasha. And we can say this is a very, very brief overview and encourage everyone to, to go to the book and, and read your chapter in full to get the fuller picture of everything you would have been able to tell us today had, had we more time. But these are important uh, messages, I think, to highlight, particularly around the, the data gaps and areas where we need more up-to-date information and also the learning from, from the data we do have um, showing this obvious disproportionate impact on women in terms of the difficulties accessing the health services and, and the structural barriers as well from the, the registries. So um, we'll move now uh, to Chantit Chenura, who is the chief of the program on the implementation of the Bangkok rules and treatment of offenders at the Thailand Institute of Justice. 
uh, Chanti co-authored the chapter on drug policy and women in prison in Southeast Asia. So over to you, Chanti. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Triona. And good evening, everyone from Bangkok, Thailand. Um, on behalf of the Thailand Institute of Justice, or TIJ, um, I would like to express my appreciation and, and we are delighted to be part of this important event. And um, it has been my pleasure to have a chance to contribute to um, uh, this important book, the chapter that I and my colleague Ukit Son Pom at the Thailand Institute of Justice co-author focus on drug policies and women in prison in Southeast Asia. And in this chapter, along with other, a few other publications that are uh, launched by TIJ, we highlight the common use of harsh punishment and, and um, punitive sentencing for drug offenses and its impact on women, as well as the implementations of the UN Bangkok rule in this field. So just to give you an uh, a overview about the Southeast Asia and, and the drug policy. So Southeast Asia is a region that's faced with the uh, rapid expansions of methamphetamine market and as a consequence of the uh, punitive uh, drug law the region suffer from prison overcrowding according to the available data which uh, from the world prison brief it showed that the um, one of the country which is philippines has the highest prison uh, occupancy rate in asia and the world's second largest um, prison overcrowding rate and this followed by other uh, countries such as Thailand, you know, we are ranked six and Cambodia ranks 22nd. So drug policy majorly contribute to overcrowding in most prison in the region and, um, and the prison overcrowding remain the key obstacle in implementing any international standard and norm. The ratio of drug related prisoner is very high in, in the region. In Thailand, 80% of prisoner uh, are incarcerated because of drug-related offense. And um, in the neighboring country, the situation is not so different. Um, the figure is also high in Singapore, 74%, and Mal uh, in Malaysia, uh, Malaysia it's 56%. And um, since the adoption of the United Nations rules for the treatment of women's prisoners, or the, the so-called UN Bangkok rules in 2010, we have seen the ratio of women uh, incarcerated for drug offenses has um, gradually uh, increased. Uh, in Thailand, as of now, 85% uh, of women uh, convicted of women's prisoner uh, has been incarcerated because of drug-related offense. And this has caused us the, you know, um, the uh, concern, uh, and this has been a clear uh, impact of the drug policy on, on women who are mainly in prison because of drug uh, um, procession for consumption and for sale. And in the region, uh, mandatory uh, capital punishment and or uh, discre uh, discre uh, discretionary capital uh, punishment for drug related offense apply in most countries in the region. Uh, and the punitive nature of drug law uh, in Southeast Asia leads to mitigating factors not being considered during sentencing for a low level uh, offense offender, as well as serious offenses such as drug trafficker. Um, as a consequence, most women uh, prisoners are held for nonviolent and low level uh, drug offenses. And their inability to afford bails and uh, legal representation further contribute to the over incarceration of, of women's uh, drug offender. And um, in order to ensure the principle of proportionalities of sentencing is being applied. So we have been promoting together with uh, other uh, organizations uh, to uh, ensure the sentencing policy need to take into consideration gender and vulnerability factors instead of focusing on uh, purely qualities or types of substance. It's important to take into consideration so the entire backgrounds of women's drug offender, which include um, their uh, poverty, uh, social exclusions, um, lack of uh, access to education and employment, other inequalities uh, uh, factors that have led women down to the uh, drug offending uh, pathway. And recently, uh, TIJ, uh, in collaborations with UNODC, we have launched the uh, Toolkit on Gender Responsive Non-Custodial Measure and highlight 
uh, this importance of uh, using these mitigating factors and, and um, more use of gender responsive non-custodial sanction and measure. And there, was, there are several uh, research and study that focus on harmful effects on the use of, of imprisonment on women, including women's uh, drug offenders. And in Southeast Asia, we find that uh, in, in many uh, countries, women are being located to prison far away from home and from their family, and especially women who serve a long sentence or women who are committed of a, a cross-border drug trafficker. Uh, women also have a lack of quality uh, legal uh, representations. Some cannot afford uh, a high quality lawyer. And, and once in prison, women have also limited access to uh, certain program and, and work vocational training due to the overcrowding situation. So since uh, 2020 was the, the year of the 10th anniversary of the Bangkok rules, and on the, um, I, I would like to stay on the positive side and say that there has been some progress uh, in promoting and implementing the, the Bangkok rules. And, and we can and we should applaud to this uh, global effort. But we still also you know, noted that there is so much work that needs to be done. And I wish to highlight a few issues. So first, although the Bangkok rule has been there for a decade, but when it's come to implementation, the priority is uh, highly concentrated on custodial setting, prison conditions, and um, only some groups of women can actually benefit from the rules. Therefore, we need to promote more use of non-custodial measure and sanction, not because it is an alternative to prison, but because it is more humane and, and is more proportionate to a, a low-level uh, of offensive offender. Sentencing policies and court systems that play a critical role in dividing uh, the criminalizations of women. So when the court failed to have a clear understanding or send us a responsive investigative procedure or sentencing guideline, the decision that came out can be punitive for, for women's offender. So as we promote the Bangkok rules for the future, we need to involve more a wider range of stakeholder, including judges, legislator, a prosecutor, as well as lawyer or even a law student, uh, in order for us to achieve our goal of reducing the unnecessary use of imprisonment for women. Prison authority can no longer be the only primary target when it comes to planning for advocacy and training strategy. Second, it is important to consider uh, intersecting vulnerability that women face in prison. Just as in the free world, um, women prisoners with uh, non-majority non status confronting a uh, wide range forms of uh, discrimination. Um, and most prison in the region and around the world still face challenges to providing and protecting uh, some groups of women. And, and, and as we promoting a, a more inclusive, gender responsive criminal justice policies and practices, we need to ensure that the needs of all groups of women should be taken into consideration and across all the dimensions of age, race, ethnicity, culture, sexuality, for example. And finally, for us to ensure the um, gender responsive drug policy reform, uh, systematic sex uh, disaggregated data collection uh, is much needed. The Bangkok rules highlight the importance you know, of having uh, data and research on the reason why women commit crime, their offending and impact of imprisonment. And in the past 10 years, we have seen the increasing number of research has been done by research institute, civil society, NGO and academy. But I believe, personally believe that that is not enough. Uh, we need to have a systematic a data collections which can cover a wide range and, and a larger sample of women that could help us um, uh, develop a gender sensitive policy and development. So therefore we need a nationwide systematic uh, data collection uh, uh, to ensure the, the uh, effective and evaluation of our program. And finally, as we look towards the 10 years, um, I think we need to look beyond the Bangkok as is the guideline for gender uh, sensitive uh, uh, for prison management and use that to advocate for other changes like just like other uh, organization is doing right now. And for us, uh, TIJ, uh, we have been working in Southeast Asia, but um, we uh, would be stand ready to work with other member states and civil society organizations to promote uh, gender responsive drug policy reform worldwide and chip away from uh, punitive to more 
rehabilitative framework. So thank you. Thank you, Chantis. Um, excellent presentation, just rounding off the sort of impact on, I guess, prison populations in particular and, and punitive drug policies as a driver of um, the imprisonment of women. Um, analysis by PRI last year uh, for the 10th anniversary of the Bangkok rules that you mentioned found there had been a 17% increase in the last 10 years since the rules were adopted in the global uh, female prison population, but this is significantly higher in Asia and uh, Latin America where punitive drug policies are, are a particular driver. So um, last but certainly not least, um, we go now to Monica Marginet Flinch. Uh, we wanted to bring the voice of affected women to the CNZ and we're privileged to have Monica with us who will tell us about her personal experience with drugs and about um, an innovative programme run by and for women in Barcelona, uh, Metzenere. Over to you, Monica. Hola, buenas tardes. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. And sorry, I think there, it sounds like they're throwing a party downstairs when the program just started. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about my experience with, with drugs and in, uh, in prison. And uh, so I was, uh, I was uh, arrested by uh, police uh, because they found me in the streets uh, and uh, it was, uh, I was, I was using at the time and uh, I, I was meant to be on methadone, but I wasn't able to ac access it. So I was uh, really using a lot. I was also drinking alcohol and, uh, and I'd been using drugs since I was 17 years old. And I had tried to quit many times uh, through detox, uh, through different services, and I'd never been successful. So when I was 23 years old, I became pregnant with my oldest daughter, and I started uh, another treatment program. And when the program ended, uh, I, uh, I had to do a, another methadone program, and they, they tested me and found, me found that I was positive for cocaine, and that's when uh, I started having all these legal issues again. And I was sent to prison, and that's when um, the, the issues with public health really became uh, very significant in, in my life. And there, when I was uh, going through the legal process, um, it took two years, and uh, Every time I was receiving, uh, there was a different lawyer coming to help me, and they weren't even able. We have something in Spain that's called uh, uh, it's a certain benefit that I wasn't even able to uh, receive. And so this whole, I, I was in a situation for twelve years, and so, so, and that's that's a really long time to be imprisoned as you can imagine. And so I became very rebellious. I was very uh, discontent. And uh, I, I ended up uh, being sent to solitary confinement for nine months because I got, uh, I got into a fight with uh, one of the other women in, in the prison. And so uh, I was always a very desperate to, to try and uh, find the drugs that I could use and uh, they when they when they when they released me they didn't give me any kind of heads up they didn't let me know uh, ahead of time and I really had no uh, no prior notice of what was going on and and I was living in extremely horrible conditions, filthy conditions. I really wasn't able to access the necessary services. And, and, and many times uh, there, women are uh, have to deal with even more severe 
your contributions uh, where they uh, have their children taken from them. Uh, then I started using uh, heroin when I wasn't able to access the drugs. And uh, I, I had the opportunity to, uh, to begin living with move to a specialized apartment uh, for, for women who have uh, prior charges, prior drug-related charges. And, and I wasn't able to uh, access sufficient housing, and I ended up becoming homeless. So um, this is why I I, uh, I decided to go to this specialized apartment, and that's when when my life uh, really started to, to change uh, when I decided to uh, to commit to. Uh, uh, to stopping my, my drug use. And uh, I started studying, I started studying uh, social education in the, in the university. I got my degree uh, and I, I was, uh, I was, I had been living with my daughter uh, for a few years by that point. So uh, there's a program in um, there's a uh, syringe exchange program in uh, in prison, and this program, which is meant to be confidential and anonymous, uh, is uh, completely wrapped up in uh, bureaucracy and uh, red tape, and it really doesn't uh, end up being that way because um, they end up being very suspicious of women. Uh, they are always worried that women are uh, bringing syringes into their cells, and and uh, they they come and they threaten you and they tell you, oh, if you have uh, if you have any open syringes, uh, you better tell us now, or or it's going to end up worse for you if we find out that you do and you didn't tell us. And there was also the issue of uh, HIV transmission due to uh, sharing. Um, Sharing needles, and uh, I, there's um, there's a harm reduction program. Uh, that's not really how I understand it. Um, but supposedly, the idea behind it is that there's a different strategy or a different a different uh, method of treatment for women who use drugs. And this program didn't work for a lot of women. For some, it did, but for many, it didn't. Um, and they actually, uh, uh, the facility, they, they shut it down three years ago in order to build a facility for, for men. Uh, so we can see here as well uh, the very uh, kind of sexist focus and the, the, the how uh, gender issues also influence these problems. And many, many women, uh, when they are released, and they haven't been able to really plan for the future. And they, they find themselves on the street, essentially. And uh, we, we think, oh, you know, when I get out, I'm going to uh, find a support group. And, and, and then you're just chucked out onto the street and with very little preparation. Uh, so, we um, we came together and we we created a, a support group in order to better be able to uh, respond to the needs of these women who are being released from prison. And so we we, we provide support for them, uh, helping them, uh, providing them with clothes, for example, and 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 some of the work that we have been doing and at the University of Barcelona and. Uh, an uh, organization named Aisa. Uh, we've been working with uh, these women. And after that, I also worked for uh, two years uh, for uh, children or, or girls who are wards of the state. And I, I knew that I wanted to, uh, to work in this field due to the all the suffering that I had faced uh, in my experience. 
So uh, I was speaking to a colleague from uh, from this group called Cassandra, which works with these um, these girls who went to the state, and um, we, uh, we had the idea for Mujeres, and uh, we were both really uh, excited about the idea and, and really optimistic, and that's that's where we that's where we really got got started, and um, I was able to uh, to share and share what I learned from my own experience, my own lived experience, um, and, and telling her uh, what it's like on the other side, what it's like to actually go through this. And, and we had, uh, there was an event recently in Las Mujeres uh, to help combat uh, the risk of overdose uh, among drug users. And I really felt uh, appreciative of the space because I felt that it was a safe space where I I was really free from judgment. Um, there, I didn't feel the same stigma that I'm so used to uh, that I've I've experienced in my life. And uh, so it's it's honestly great. That's that's where I'm working at the moment. Um, and and the 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 connection, the rapport that we have with women is is really really special and it's it's a, it's a way that of uh, continuing the uh, work that I was doing with the other women at Cassandra uh, to help build bridges and bridge the gap between uh, women who are incarcerated and those on the outside and and so we also try to uh, influence policy, drug policy, and prison policy. Uh, so it's very important to try and uh, deconstruct the different social obstacles that uh, are upheld and, and help, to, help to uphold stigma. And uh, the space Matineres is the safe space to, to connect with each other, to uh, exchange uh, experiences to, sh to, sh uh, to share knowledge um, and to uh, continue with our advocacy work and our activism. And so uh, there's uh, several uh, there's several women working at Matineres at the moment, and we've uh, we're working in conjunction with uh, legal professionals and and. Um, there, there are women uh, who we help at Mercedes who uh, are starting to uh, receive alternative treatments. So that's that's an initiative that we want to continue with, and because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, we're trying to provide uh, an alternative, a different reality for um, for women who are incarcerated for drug related charges, and um, for those who are facing charges and for those who are already incarcerated we want to provide them with more support and so that women know uh, when they are released they will be able to find accommodation and that they're not going to be homeless after they are released from prison and so from a harm reduction perspective we've we've realized I'm sorry monica we'll, many, we'll have to finish up if you can make a, a final comment or thought. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up. And so the last thing I'd like to say, uh, I just want to really emphasize uh, and because of my experience with the prison system, and when you when you get a little bit of distance from the experience that you've you've lived, you're able to uh, help use the experience and the knowledge that you've gained to make the situation better for others. Thank, Thank you, you very Monica. much for listening to me. I think that's um, the perfect place to wrap up the the presentations and you know highlighting the the very personal um, impact on women and the reality uh, faced by so many women in criminal justice systems and uh, the just real significant difference that a positive program or approach can have in people's lives. 
So we are over time already. Thank you so much to all of the attendees who are still with us. You're showing real commitment. And um, I think we're just going to quickly maybe take one question um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so there was a question um, in relation to research and particularly around research that's available in Southeast Asia and maybe elsewhere. <laughs> I think then Chantik, you may have responded already. Is there anything you'd like to say on that uh, for all the attendees? No, I, I think uh, there's always room for more research, uh, Kiona. And and I think um, to to um, to have some sort of research collaborations in Southeast Asia. I know um, IDPC has has a, a quite a nice list of of research covering Indonesia, Philippines, and and Thailand and. And TIJ ourselves has produced a research on Thailand and also a uh, on Cambodia as well. So, so I think even that um, uh, there are still more room because you know with the changing in characteristic uh, uh, of women's in prison and because of the you know the large number of women in, in incarcerated. So, so I think uh, yes. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to say anything on research? No. Dasha? Yeah, yeah, I just I just wanted to add that um, one particular type of research that I think is really important is community led research. And uh, we have um, I was I'm really privileged to have been part of several projects. They were very different in terms of their design and funding and some were very had very, very limited funding. But when the research is done, you know, about the request of women who use drugs and by women who use drugs, and they are, you know, involved as a research team. You know, sometimes there is a need of some um, researcher, maybe with some more experience in different uh, issues, but it really, I mean, that is probably the best investment of time and funding. And I really would like to you know, tell this to every one of us that there is always an opportunity to whenever we work on local level or country or global levels to really engage with women, engage with women networks and groups, you know, and discuss what they want to be studied, what specific aspects, you know, of lives or criminalization of policies or service access they want to document and then also help to publish this and promote um, globally. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's the perfect point to end on. And I'm sorry that that's all we have time for today, but um, we encourage you again to take a look at the book if you haven't, um, and all of the resources shared in the chat today. And you're welcome to contact um, any of the organizing partners of today's event with further questions, and we'll um, connect you to any of the panelists. So a huge thank you to all of the panelists who have given us such a, an insight into the variety of ways that women are impacted by global drug policies. Your contributions and all of the contributions in the book give us so much to think about when we go forward in our own work towards reform and, and for better outcomes for women and communities. Thank you also to all of our co-organizing partners for today's event. The International Drug Policy Consortium, CELS, De Justitia, the Thailand Institute of Justice, and the Washington Office on Latin America. Um, a special thank you to Marie Nugier for her help in bringing us together today. She's been working in the background. Um, and of course, to all of you, our participants, um, for your interest and engagement. We wish you a very positive rest of the CND, and thank you for joining us. Take care. <laughs>